episode number 734 on this January 29th. It's actually the 28th. I'm uh, doing the intro on a Sunday and acting like it's a Monday. Hey, how about those football games yesterday? I don't know, because the games fucking haven't happened yet. That's why I'm not going to be talking about it at the uh, front of the show. Anyway... I'm in Vegas, and uh, I just wanted to get the show and the intro all together so I can watch the games, then do the last two shows at the Comedy Cellar tonight in uh, at the Rio, and then drive home at fucking 11 at night like a goddamn soldier, as the great Joey Diaz would say. Gertie on my uh, passenger side. Trying to keep me awake tonight. Anyway, welcome to the show, everybody. Fantastic week in Las Vegas. A lot of good shows. Working on the new material. Getting ready for the 2024 run around the country. Some of the shows coming up. If you are new to the show, I am a comedian. And that's what I do for a living. I do this show to hopefully uh, get some butts in the seats. That's why I do the podcast, really. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> 12 fucking years I've been on this microphone hoping that uh, people go, you know, I like his podcast. Maybe I'll go see him do some comedy. Well, you got a lot of options coming up here. Uh, I'm going to be in Minneapolis in March at the Great Acme Comedy Club. I am looking forward to that. Get your tickets in advance for all these shows at deandelray.com. I'm going to be in Fort Collins, Colorado. In March, another incredible club. I'll be in San Diego at the Mic Drop. First time doing that club. And then uh, in the next few weeks, I'll be traveling around with my good friend, Mr. Bill Burr. We'll be in Palm Springs looking at some beautiful architecture for Modernism Week. And then doing a couple shows out there in uh, some arena. And Portland, you'll be up next, that Trailblazers Arena. I can't wait to go to Portland and see my man Ship John and, and my buddies over, uh, where else do I like to go there? Oh, uh, the Langlets. Yeah, I want to go over to Langlets and uh, check out some leathers. Vancouver, I'll be stopping by the, uh, what's that called, the shop? Uh, you know, I do shows, and then during the day, I go all these places I always wanted to go. Salt Lake City, maybe I'll see my man Jeff Decker. Anyway, there it is. Those are the tour dates for the next two months. Lots of them, lots of good stuff. Like I said, I am in Las Vegas, the last two shows tonight. And then I'll be back in Las Vegas next fucking week, taking a rare weekend off for my 58th birthday, Saturday, February 3rd. I was born the day the music died. Buddy Holly, Big Bopper, and Richie Valens. uh, That horrific plane crash on February 3rd. Uh, I wasn't born the same year or I'd be 900 years old. But anyway, I'm going to go see you two at the Sphere. So next time you tune in, I'll be 58. Hopefully I'll still be alive. Can't believe I'm going to be 58 already. This shit goes by, man. Fucking just lightning speed lap. Just fucking, you just, you take your shit one day and then it's over. Anyway, feel pretty good for 58. And uh, thank God I got diabetes like seven years ago so I could turn it around and not be dead by now. I thank you for tuning in. I know a lot of you are here today and maybe have never been a listener of my show. But you're here today because of one of the greatest musicians, I think, in the last 30 years. And that is an honest truth coming out of my mouth. I've watched this man from when I was very young, the bottom of the hill in Caius, uh, opening for Danzig around California in Caius, eventually starting Queens of the Stone Age, catching a Many, many, many times, including that weird Virgin Inn store at Union Square in San Francisco, which was one of the coolest shows I ever fucking saw. I also uh, have seen this man and them crooked vultures at the Roxy. I have been a massive fan of Josh Homme. And to uh, 
have him as a friend is a damn honor. And if you are uh, new to the show, like I said, and have not caught the last two episodes with Josh, relax. This is the kind of conversation we have. A couple friends sit down and we just reflect on life. And that's really what it is. A lot of times we don't get to see each other enough because uh, I'm on the road and he's on the road. And so when we do see each other, it is definitely just a, an exact conversation that we would have if the mics weren't on. I absolutely love this man, and uh, he is a huge influence on me, just in uh, life and work ethic and, oh man, everything. He loves comedy. He loves stand-up comedy. And man, uh, I love that about him. And, you know, he's like, to me, like uh, Jacob Dylan. He could easily be a comedian. Not in a joker way. I'm talking about in a super smart, fucking fast, witty comedian style. Anyway, what an honor to have him on again. I, uh, I gave their newest record, if you guys uh, do listen to the show, in Times New Roman. I gave it my favorite record of 2023, and uh, which, by the way, The Smile just dropped a record uh, Friday, you know, Tom York, The Smile, and uh, holy shit, this could be the record of 2024, and we're only uh, two weeks in. Man. Anyway, thank you, Josh, for doing the show. Go see them, Australia, New Zealand, and then, of course, around America again and Europe. They're going to be doing Bottle Rock up in Napa and uh, a bunch of other shows. Their live show is absolutely spectacular. I just saw them at the uh, forum, and fuck, it blew my mind. Big shout out to the new Patreoners. Kenny Abel, Lisa Heaney, Heaney, Steve Ronan, John Colotti. Thank you for being part of my Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Tune in this week. I will talk about my thoughts and uh, my post on Cliff Williams' possible retirement uh, from a uh, good, reliable source that I heard. Cliff Williams of ACDC will no longer be playing or touring if they do tour again. Anyway, I'll be talking about that and I'll dig more into the smile record and uh, a few other things. I love all of you. Thank you for tuning in. Let's get into the show right now. Enjoy it, my friends. Mr. Josh Homme. All right. Malibu, you got me out to Malibu. I did. Yeah. It was a dirty little trick. <laughs> dirty dreams. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, man, because it was like, I was wondering how you even fucking knew. You're like, hey, are you coming out to Shangri-La? I was like, uh, <laughs> and I knew, totally what, I knew. What got was you red handed. I knew what was coming. <laughs> folks, folks, what I did is I said, if you're willing to come out for someone else. Yeah. You got to come out here for me. Come on. What's the problem? And his response was, it was almost like, you know, you take a strawberry, which is a beautiful thing. You dip it in chocolate. And now you can't even see the strawberry because your your okay was dipped in so much disappointment. <laughs> yeah. The chocolate of disappointment. <laughs> I love it because hold on, I think I got your text. It was fucking hilarious. Look, it was like, uh, are you doing a podcast at Shangri La? <laughs> like, right, but it was. I, I'm reading it in that town. Yeah, that's like, the tone. Hey, that was it. it. Yeah. Like, are you serious? You really? Yeah. You're doing a podcast at Shangri La? Are you out of your mind? And then I and I go. I was supposed to, but it didn't happen. Man, why am I coming to you? <laughs> <laughs> I live a quarter mile from Shangri-La. I was only, and I go, I was only doing that to see the studio. Well, I guess you'll be coming out here tomorrow. <laughs> we'll do it at Shangri-La. <laughs> I'm like, oh, come what, see. What time? <laughs> <laughs> There's no good time. There is no good time. There is no, but you know, it's worth it. Well, for I you. appreciate you coming all the way out here. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'm bringing Gertie. I'm going to take a it, picture. It's cute, those. Uh, she looks so cute. It's those West Side, East Side uh, 
thing. Never, Troubles. Never see people again. A good friend of mine lived out here. I think I told you this story. And he called me one day. He lived out here like five years. And he goes, hey, when was the last time I saw you? And I go, I don't know, like six months ago. And he goes, yeah, I used to see you like three times a week. I'm moving tomorrow. <laughs> Meaning he, he doesn't see anybody yeah. anymore. And he started to slowly go crazy. Yeah. Almost I have a, the shining. I have a little bit of that, yeah. I, I, I came out here to slow down and right. to figure things out and to have enough feel like I wasn't pressured by time so that I could untangle all these knots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it worked and then I got the knots done and, and then I, I said to myself, now what, you know, I, I get a little bit of cabin fever out here. And what's funny is that out in the desert where there's nobody like in, in the, you know, in the high desert where there's nobody, I, I don't feel the same. You know, yeah. I, I feel, I don't feel as crimped as I feel here a little bit. And it's beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's, and there's some great people out here, but it's just, it feels so far from the city. It does. And there's always those people. I've never been this person, but you know, those people, they're like, oh, I got to live by the water. Sure. Yeah. And uh, I've never been that guy. And we talked about it earlier because uh, like I was at Sam Bayer's house years and years ago and I saw all his stuff was rusted. And I was so into like vintage cars. I was like, I could never be out here. Sure. It would destroy the rides. Yeah. You know? But uh you know, if I had plenty of money, we're at Rick Rubin's studio right now. I would absolutely live here. Just if get I new parts for the motorcycle. Yeah, if I wasn't doing <laughs> comedy rusted. anymore. Right. And I always say that. Like, I go, if I wasn't doing comedy anymore, where would I live? And I could live out here, but on, on what money? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would be funny in itself. It you know, I, 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 I completely agree. I, I think I'm... I, I'm always inspired by somebody who is so adamant that they say, I have to live by the water or I have to live in the forest. Yeah. Because I, my preference is, is to be in the desert. I, I feel comfortable there. Um, and I really like the beach, but I don't have to be anywhere. Yeah. I mean, there's, I know a lot of people that live out here because of just that. I got to be near the water. That's it. I got to be near the water. You know, I just don't have that same... Uh, necessity i certainly like it it's it's beautiful yeah i'm not getting in the water yeah <laughs> that's the thing and i and the beach come on that's <laughs> I, that's how i was going to end this in a romantic date <laughs> you came all I, this goddamn way just <laughs> nude at zuma <laughs> just you know braided braiding them together as they say <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, man uh well we are here and it is uh amazing to my name is joshua by the way yeah Th uh, third time you've been on yes always uh probably top five guests of all time and also so when, number five you no know, no. <laughs> no i would just, say at points number I, one i heard this recently that yeah. if someone says you're one of my top five favorite musicians that, that you're like yeah so it's number five <laughs> <laughs> yeah right i mean i'm in there yeah but it's number five yeah it is true, though, and it is weird to think about each time I go to interview you, I know it's going to be fucking fun, and which, by the way, you said you wanted to inter interview me this time. And well, I no, like, I said what I wanted to do. Yeah. This is, a, this is for another episode. This cool. is for the fourth time. Okay. That, that it would be you're doing stand-up, because you told me that well, yeah, you were right. driving around, you were driving around. And I said, damn, that's like a lot of... Uh, spots. That's a lot of gas money to yeah. do a lot of spots in a night. Because it started in Hollywood and in Burbank, and there was something in betwixt that, right? Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, I should go with you and interview you in the interim and the drive between sets. I would love that. On a, on a three-set night. Yeah. So that's, that'll be the next thing. Well, I'm, Stay I'm, tuned for that next thing. That's yeah, the, I'm into that big yeah. time. Yeah, it'll be good. Because we'll it, it is a, a, a strange dynamic. You're unlike New York where you're just running around doing spots. You get on the subway. Sure. And you get off and you're there. In L.A., when I started comedy, I was able to do a zillion spots a week because I was on a motorcycle and nobody else was. Yeah. So I'd show up and they go, hey, such and such is stuck in traffic. Uh, you want to go on? And I go, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
And I got five spots a night. People are like, how are you doing five in a night in L.A.? That's impossible. Right. People do 10 in, in New York. But you also know if you're doing five a night, you're scattered across the time frame of the night, too. Right. Because I like I'm I'm guessing with all the all things comedy, but, you know, I'm a comedy nerd. Yeah. So uh, my guess is, is that the audience changes from that early show to the to the the drunkards at the end of the night. Yeah. And you must get a that's a wide swath of people. There's so many dynamics, man. Yeah. You know, it's like early. So, but people are coming specifically at 7.30 because I want to laugh. I'm right. coming because I want to laugh. Yeah. I'm ready to laugh. Yep. I'm here to laugh. But there's a weird it's, thing yeah, out of an early crowd. Sometimes it's a little bit Salt Lake story. City. It's a little Mormon. It's something about like, we're coming to laugh at 7.30. <laughs> yeah. I am here. We showered. <laughs> yeah. We ate yeah. early. We're, we're ready. We're combed, dressed, groomed, yeah. groomed. Yeah. Ready to go. Yeah. It's a, it's a dynamic. It's just like rock, you know, every city, every set time is all different and it becomes all this weird shit as you do it longer and longer. You're like, fuck last night I'm at a show. It's an hour behind. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm going to leave because I don't want to go on at 1130 after five people because they're going to be done. And I was supposed to be on at 1020. It's not a diva thing. It's just like, it's not going to be quality to me. Right. Yeah. Well, you start, you start having the experience to sort of understand that, that you understand it enough to say this won't be as quality. Right. And I don't need to do something that's of less quality for, there's no reason. Right. But because I, I used to, like I used to, uh, I, I think I would have, my blanket statement would have been, I want to perform when they're a little more inebriated. Like I'd rather take on the drunk crowd, you know, cause I like them loose. Right. right. But, but in truth, what I understand I'm really looking for now is I want you to have had the chance to do what you want to do that gets you in a spot that's loose. And for some people that's not drinking at all, you know, no. and, and, and some people that's nothing that's, you know, having iced tea and some people it's smoking weed and some people it's sniffing glue in the parking lot. Yeah. But, I, I want to play for the in the the magic hour when everyone's had their chance to ease themselves into the jacuzzi of this moment. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? yeah. I think yeah. it's you're looking for the crowd where they've gotten rid of the boss in their mind of a job or the commute or anything, and their brain is ready. That's what you're looking for, a ready brain. Right. I'm set. And I'm like, set and I'm ready yeah, to go. Well, ready. when you first get there, if it's too goddamn early, it's yeah. too goddamn early. And then, honestly, by the time it's like 1230, unless we're in Spain, you got troubles. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you know, it's a whack-a-mole. Yeah. That's my assumption for comedy. And certainly when the audience, I always have this philosophy that the, the audience needs to be on their heels. I need to be on my toes leaning forward. They need to be leaning back on their heels. And, and, uh, but it's wonderful when we're all standing in the middle of our feet. And that's just about the emotion, yeah. right? You know, who's in, who's in emotional charge of this situation, you know? You don't want the audience to take over. You're on your heels. Yeah. And oh, they're yeah. on their toes leaning into They can into sense you. that. Oh, yeah, it's, and they'll, they'll eat you alive. Oh, fuck yeah. They're you like, know? this guy doesn't have any confidence. He doesn't know what he's doing. You suck. Yeah, cr you know? right. They'll, and they'll give you the worst, the worst heckle is you suck. You know, something yeah. simple. Yeah, you know yeah. that's just ridiculous. That should be, I mean, any comedian with a solid that has should have enough crowd work skill to take on a you suck. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. It's funny. Fucking, I saw uh, Joe List, uh, friend of mine, funny uh, comedian. Yeah, he's funny. Yeah, he did a uh, clip, just a, uh, a make made up clip to promote a show at during his set. He's like, somebody yell out, "I suck." And that guy goes, you suck. And he goes, your dad's dick every night. I love it. You know, like, yeah. It's like re yeah, but, really insane. You yeah. know, like, Putting a twist on it. Yeah. And then he's like, oh, by the way, see me in San Francisco next week. He's doing an ad for his gig at the gig, the yeah. next gig. I was like <laughs> fucking hilarious. But yeah, you know, yeah. It's, uh, it's a weird animal. And, it, and also, I, I wanted to ask you this because I played music so long and so have you. And now I do comedy, I can't even tell you how many shows I've reached some kind of ultra high, mm -hmm. cliche sounding, but like, oh my God, that was insane. It is true though. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's not, generalizations come from a, a stacking of truth, the sky's blue, water's wet. I mean, you, right. you know, it is that high of playing. But my point is, with a band, there's so many things that could go wrong 
where the high might be kicked off. Somebody else is having a bad night in the group or whatever. Where with a comedian, I found that I've hit these really crazy high marks way more than when I played music. Yeah. Well, I think I think in the case of, of Queens of the Stone Age, as a as a group of guys, we get along so well. Right. And we've known each other so long. We when if we go on vacation, we go together. And yeah. when we're not on tour. So I've never got along so effortlessly with a group of people where no one's afraid to say anything because nobody says anything in a way that shoves you into a wall. Yeah. It's not, you it's know. not coming at you. Yeah. It's like, uh, whether, and whether that's nay saying something or, or agreeing to do something or trying something, you know, cause there certainly is a lot of trial and error to be in a band. You're doing it on your own. You're not having to sort of do it, you know, playing on every, with every, a bunch four other people's emotions too, you know, at the same time. Exactly. But, but I think for us, it's gotten to a spot where there's a telepathy and a shorthand that's that's always encouraging <laughs> it's that's never discouraging yeah you know, and for some reason when we play now i just have a different uh feeling about it it almost feels like everything before is, is inside of a book and the book is closed and this is brand new now you know because i i you know i want the shows to go well so bad but i want to do it by investigating them and changing them so I, I want to feel like I'm in a new maze every night. Yeah, and and it's it's so important to me to like that 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 I get to the end of the maze or like you get out of the escape room or whatever that is, that analogy is, you know. And and so if a song doesn't go well because we haven't played it in seven years and it's like okay, and it doesn't go well, I don't I don't get upset or think the rest. Well, we got this next one here. This one's going to be good. I don't ever, it never gets me down if something goes strange. Yeah. Where, where before, I think I was susceptible to the audience and the situation and the, you know, I was the, the environment. I, that stuff could really affect me. And here, now I feel like uh, everyone's here because they want to be. And, um, and it's our job to set the mood and then for everyone to do what they're, they're supposed to do when the mood is set. Yeah, yeah. Like it seems so, so much more simple and that understanding because people people are driving from jobs they can't stand trying to get rid of the boss just yelled at me yeah. or whatever it is whatever it is right that's one some basic garden variety example but they really are showing up saying okay we set the move so i can just do what i want with my i brought my friends and then we're going to do what whatever we want and i just that's all it is now and that makes it more simple for me to do it or to just enjoy the high because we we haven't really had a bad show yet on this trip. Oh, it's we had one. We had one. I just got. A, I just. I'd been in surgery about eight days before, which is probably I probably shouldn't have been there. It was in Chicago. You know? Yeah. But the show was there, and I'm just not ready to cancel anything ever for any reason. And so, you know, when you get put under for six hours, you're not supposed to just. Yeah. With it, and so it wasn't great, but it still wasn't terrible. You know, I mean, I wish it was better, but. I was talking to John Theodore backstage, and he was, I go, how's it going? He goes, man, this is the best tour I've ever been on. We're getting along better than ever, and it just zoomed on by. I don't even realize that we just did this run. Yeah. Which I mean, is amazing to hear. Yeah, we've almost, you know, and we're going slower. We're taking longer off in between. So I don't know. I just, you know, nobody wants to talk about the pandemic, so I'm not going to spend any time there. But because everyone went through something, uh, and and all I got from it was like pick the three things that you really care about and nothing else matters. Go ahead. And and so it was just having and focusing on those three things. Those three things, you know, family, music, health. Boom. It's right. just like But just you know, um, it's funny because now I'm like I really appreciate playing more. Uh, it's not that I didn't before. It's just now I'm like oh man, this is a great moment too to feel like you're part of something that's really that's cool you know? absolutely man it's like that's a different outlook though than i had before yeah you know? i mean last time i had you on it was a, a great episode and it was pretty honest and pretty dark and then i started putting this stuff together later on and of course the record comes out and i'm reading the lyrics and i go ah yeah i mean all everything you were going through and then the cancer you called me and said you had cancer i was like whoa what 
And I was like, oh, shit. Like, when a friend your age, you know, has cancer, you're like, oh, this is fucking crazy. Yeah. Did you know you had it then when you were at my house? Um, it's probably like uh, two years ago. No. 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 And, you know, I mean, uh, the, uh, having just lost my, my best buddy to that same thing, too, it was just like, uh, well, it just, all I know is um, I'm really glad all that stuff happened. <laughs> because I, because uh, um, it really gives you a great outlook, you know. All right. I, I, uh, um, I get to do cool stuff, and I get to to participate in art projects like I'm a kindergartner and uh and I got my family and and this is a beautiful location and uh um and life is short so and it'll probably be over in like it could easily be over in a couple months so right. so I'm sort of like so what do you want to do then it's not necessarily a negative thing it's 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 sort of if it focuses you in participating in right now it's actually it's not such a bad thing and I have weird thoughts too where I think to myself like uh like a, a nuclear explosion, that would be amazing. I mean, no, nobody wants to die, but if you were like, well, how would you like to go? Yeah. A nuclear explosion would be way up on my list. Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, we'd all go together. <laughs> we'd all go together. Yeah. And it would look fucking so insane that that explosion, especially if you're like, uh, say, I don't know, 17 miles away. I don't know. Pick a number. And you see that. That just mushroom. that mushroom cloud, the ring around it, the wind, like just Comes turning everything it. into zero like behind the it. Like Oppenheimer thing. <laughs> yeah, just to the the concussion, the wind coming towards you, and seeing that everything behind that wind is gone, is zero, <laughs> that yeah. doesn't exist anymore, and holding hands with everyone. It's sort of, it doesn't sound great now that I'm saying it. <laughs> <laughs> but no death will no death is going to it's not like you know i really yeah. want to you know pass out of the jacuzzi you know it's it, there's but i think that would be way up there for me what do you have one that you're willing to it's funny you say that because i do a bit where i say i go to the gym every day and i want to live jim who what's his last name jim jones <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what we're talking about that's what we're talking about Boom. but I, I go to the gym every day, and the bit goes, I want to live about 20 more years because I want to see how this whole thing ends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to I be on the porch. You're being again. really optimistic with 20 years. Yeah, I know I am. But, but, but you know, you've done enough terrible stuff to yourself, and I, I, Same have, here, yeah. I have two. Tons of drugs. Yeah, I'm 50 now. Like, yeah. There's no way I'm going to be 72 years old. This right. Is, I, and I, and I, that's okay. That's okay. Right. Uh, you know, I just like to uh, make sure whatever time that is from here to then that um, that I'm able to just be in the moment and enjoy it, you know? Oh, yeah. Because when the clock starts ticking backwards instead of forwards, oh. it's an interesting those fucking moment. Guys, those guys on Instagram, they're like, you have 15 summers left when they put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, 15 summers? What yeah. You're fuck? like, fuck, what is this, Rumblefish? You're in, you know, you're... Yeah, I'm glad. I mean, I started comedy at 44. So anything that happens now, if I die, I'm like, cool, I'm good with it because I fucking have had the most incredible last 15 years of my life. Yeah. Right now. Mm. Like, I can't even imagine if I was just working some shit job and you go, oh, you get this diagnosis and you go, I'm done. But I'd be like, well, fuck, man. When I got hit on my motorcycle, I was sliding down the freeway. Yeah. And wow. what came to mind right away was no regrets. Yeah. Oh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I you know, I've almost, I think that was my fourth time almost die or, or getting close to dying. And, uh, uh, and also, um, I've, I've made, as anyone else, have failed so many fucking times. But that's all the, I mean, what are you supposed to do? I fail daily. Yeah, what are you supposed to do? Everyone does. It's if you're not willing to sort of acknowledge that. And, you know, I, I think was, my grandpa used to say, like, uh, we, you know, you should be ambitious in your 20s and you should be failing and flailing and falling down. And then you should, at the, when you get in your early 30s, you should be picking what you want to, you know, what you're, what you're good at, what you're going to stick with. And then you need to take all that failure and experience in your 40s and, and enjoy doing a good job and enjoy doing that good job with your experience and, th and then in your 50s you, you kill yourself no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Man, no, I'm kidding. And it's uh it is it is a interesting time right now and like you said man i just get up each day i go oh my god a couple days ago i didn't have any spots at the comedy store and the dark deep hole that i went into is just like it's, it's why over. because it because you it's almost like is it a bit like taking a hit of something no it's not that it's just i love comedy so much and if i'm not doing it i get into this spin of like Holy shit, man! I, I I gotta get on because if I don't get on, well, that sounds an awful lot like taking a hit or something. It does, but it's not like an addiction. It's more of like something I just love to do, and and I love being part of something like sure. a comedy store. Sure. And when you're not, you get all these weird things of like, oh fuck, man, am I out? Well, you know, it's like getting stuck in the speak of. Uh that everything is a problem, like addiction. Yeah. <laughs> like it doesn't have to, wanting to take a hit doesn't have to even be, because it's just what you're passionate about, right? right. You want to be part of something and it, it feels, it, it, get, it feels important and vital and keeps you, your, keeps you to, the ability to stay sharp. Like if that's an addiction, that's fine. Fine. Oh, yeah, Who yeah. cares? Yeah. Whatever sounds your face makes, addiction, passion, yeah. you know, obsession. Yeah. And those all have these connotations, but who fucking cares if that's the, yeah. yeah, and I got no family anymore. I lost my mom, so yeah. that really is, in LA, people are always like, ah, everybody's so fake there. I'm like, everybody's fake everywhere. I got a group of fucking friends that are so real yeah. that it's I couldn't even imagine being away from them. Yeah. So oh. that gets into my head of like, oh, what if I'm not doing, con- oh, I got to keep doing it, come on. Yeah, I mean, certainly that like assertion of LA is like, well, where are you going in LA, I suppose? Yeah, yeah. yeah. What are you trying to do? Where are you out clubbing? Yeah, I mean, for Christ's sake, yeah. Is everyone, is everyone fake in the bottle service? <laughs> yeah Gee, that's i don't weird. understand that's crazy <laughs> yeah i don't know why a fifteen hundred dollar yeah. bottle of a uh, hundred dollar booze telling you how amazing that, you are wow that's <laughs> <laughs> where you're faking in the first place yeah i mean i think it's you know it's the environment you put yourself in yeah i don't recognize la as a uh as any more fake than anywhere else i know yeah exactly yeah. i gotta tell you um when the record came out the new record um it was the first time I think that this happened to me since Octung Baby when that came out. I got the record and I dove in and I was like, this is pretty good. But when I saw the live show, which by the way, could be the probably one of the best shows I've seen in 20 years. Oh, wow. And there were so you. many things I wanted to ask you about it, um, which I'm glad you didn't do the podcast when you're originally going to do it because now... I've seen the show, and what I was going to say is, once I saw it live, I was like, oh, fuck. I really started to get it. Yeah, I don't think we're, in, I, th- I don't think that, that Queens of the Stone is just a very easy first listen band. I, I you know. Well, I because, think early on, Desert, of course we get it. Well, and it's new then, too. I mean, you're talking about eight records in, where right. you do ask yourself, why should I listen to someone's eighth record? And you, or, I'm certainly asking that when when we're going to make one. I mean, you could it, you could be simple about it and say it's just here's some more new songs and that's what I like to do and leave yeah. it at that. But I I also think that we're not um, because we're building off of all these other records and because I'm thinking, well, you can't do that, but you kind of want to tip your hat to these old records at some point and 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 you know I like to write songs that are cousins of another song. Yeah, like it could be at the same family reunion, you know. And I like to mess with ideas that are in the same range as some of these other songs are. But you, it it means that even when our songs are simple, they're somehow a little bit complicated. So that first listen or two, I have people all the time that that were like, I, until the ninth listen, I didn't get it. And I was like, you, you, but you went back nine times. That's thank God you're you're <laughs> yeah. doing that. Yeah. yeah, instead of one and done. Yeah, instead of like, I don't get it, see a Frisbee. Especially in the ADD world where people are like, nah, and they're oh, just hitting nah, nah, yeah. in the stream world. I mean, what a blessing it is to have people give it a fifth chance. Yeah. Because it will, it, I, I believe, like, I believe if you like rock and roll, this will work at, by the fifth time. You'll, you'll understand where this is, you know? Well, I think also sometimes you're not in the right frame of mind for a record. 
And for that's, sure. that's happened to me, even with, you know, groups like Springsteen early in, in my early age. I was like, nah. Yeah. And now I can't imagine my life without him. Sure. Um, but oh, yeah, well, because music is a bit like a tool. Yeah. You know, and you if you have a new tool that you don't understand how to use, you're like, what is this fucking thing? Yeah. But once you understand it, you kind of use it in the moments of your life that you think you need it, and it, it's the best tool for the job. Yeah. You know, and, and so I just, I my outlook has gotten more that way where i i want to make this specialized tool that you know um it but it takes a second to learn how to use it you know i mean it should i i think if you if it takes five listens to start to understand something that means you've got 10 times that amount of listens before it gets old and uh, and i want someone to have listened to it 50 times you know i need them to get past the five listen nine listen hump so that they can be like 50th time that's the whoa that's the one you know, so that it's something you use all the time. It became yeah. it became a, a daily listen to me after the show because I was also I was hearing things that I didn't hear on the record that I was hearing live when I was digging into it. Uh, first of all, time and place. It, it was right in this spot in the set list where you'd played a couple of the big bigs at the top. Yeah. You know, I'm like, Oh yeah. And then, and then you played, uh, and I wanted to talk to you about set list. My God is the sun, which is my favorite off clockwork, you know? Yeah. And, and then, um, you get the time and place and I'm like, okay, Oh, this is a song on the new record. And then I start hearing stuff like, Hey, this could be a fucking Devo song, which yeah. I fucking love Devo. It certainly could. It's, and, it's from that world in yeah. that way. Yeah, just a bump, 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 bump. Right, and it could also shit. it could also be, uh, you know, um, like Benin rock and roll or Turag drone. You know, it's about uh, weaving time signatures together, and they make they make you know like a weave of something. You know? Yeah, yeah. But you separate them, and you listen to one riff, and you're like, "What is this? This isn't enough." You know, or this is just. It's off time signature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. the way that it fucking started hitting me as I was standing there, I was like, oh, this is my new favorite song. I was like so blown away by it. But to see the guys playing it live was yeah. so fucking electric. Well, you know, you, you, you start, uh, as the years go on, you start saying, what if we're writing about uh, a concept, and not in a concept album, but the concept is something like time and place musically is restraint. So you, if you just go boom, 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 boom. Now that's not exactly the riff, but if you're just doing that precisely and nothing else and everyone's shooting the gaps and then later you get to go dun, 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 dun and it's not dun, 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 it's dun, 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 yeah. dun, 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 Like these micro adjustments, when you start with restraint and then you start opening that and letting the floodgates out a little bit and but they're just these micro adjustments it's so cool oh my god it's almost like blinking lights you know and i mean it doesn't make that song cool it just means that conceptually when you're not just like i need to write a chorus about my yeah. you know my hometown or something but when when you're saying what if we're just <laughs> like a snake's belly if we're constricting and expanding and and what if a song is about that you know, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, and and you know, I mean, we have the free time. This is what we do, and we do lots of songs that are deliberately sort of trying to rework pop structure. But there needs to be moments where you just sort of like, dude, what if we were just expanding and contracting? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no one, no one sounds like you guys. No, oh, well, that's the point too. That's what's though. fucking amazing. Yeah, but it's supposed to be that way, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't look at. I, but it's I, so hard to do. Oh, uh, it's so hard to be original. And well, this, and this far, how far rock and roll is from the fucking early fifties to now? Sure. To have a sound. Right. Well, I think uh, you know, um, I, I somehow it feels like the minimum obligation is that you should sound like yourself. Yeah. I think, and uh, and so I always think. Like we're supposed to not sound like everyone else. That that almost seems like that's the first step, because that means that means we can play things like blues or mellow tunes or or experimental stuff or pop music, and because it because it sounds like us, it will naturally sound different. Yeah, you know, it's the difference between like you know, it's just the we're the filter it's going through. We're how, so it feels like in that way, 
I guess I love a band like Ween so yeah, much. And right. Ween had such a big influence on me um, because Ween can play anything they want. And they play it with such confidence that even when it's silly, um, you believe it and you know it's true. Like even when it's a joke, you understand that um, there's a certain amount of craftsmanship to making someone laugh in a song too. Done th- laughing, doing that well is tricky. Oh God, you know? yeah, it's I tricky. Mean, I still haven't gotten Ween. People hit me every six if months. You saw them live, right? You, uh, I guess another thing is is like the live. You know, we Queens and Caius opened for Ween um, uh, way early on, and I've known those guys forever. And um, you know, wanting to tour with them just to watch them play. Yeah. Like uh, we're playing too, but more importantly, I was like, oh wow, because. They would play their music. It's hard not to get them if I sat down and played them for you because they're every band all the time. Right. <laughs> right. And, and so I suppose a band like Fish is that too, but I'm not necessarily into them. Exactly. Because their version of it isn't for me. But Ween is, is like sarcastic and honest and heartbroken and drug addled and confused and mean and gentle and sweet enough. You know, their brand of that, that ratio of that. I'd watch them play something silly, something heavy, and then they'd play a 12-minute version of Riders on the Storm by the Doors that they'd never sound checked or played. They just <laughs> did it, and it sounded incredible. Yeah. And, and um, the ease which which they handled, we're going to um, set this mood. You guys do whatever you want, and we'll play while you're doing that. Yeah. That concept of that's what a live show should be. You know, it doesn't matter how many people are here. We're all in the building. We're all keeping the secret. This is what we're doing tonight. It's all, it's already ours. So go ahead and do whatever you want and hit it, boys. Let's get started. You know, I, I just, uh, that seems, I just want to have a good time now. Oh, even, I if the, that. Even, even if the music is dark, yeah. you know, you don't realize half the time how dark some of the lyrics of some of your favorite songs oh are. Oh my God, yeah. That um, was a genius of Jeff Buckley. You see him live. Songs were so dark, but in between, he'd be like, "Hey guys, did you have the burrito tonight?" And you're yep. like, "What the fuck? This guy's like a, a silly clown." And then I started thinking, "Oh, I get it. It's so if it was all fucking dark, we'd probably kill ourselves." Well, it's we a left. hard pill to swallow. It is. I mean, I think when when you you know, I love goth shit too, and like yeah. obviously Troy is a vampire who's 700 years old. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> it's, so he has no choice but to suck the blood of another generation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I think, um, you know, I guess, I guess my feeling is when you need something dark, it needs to be real and it should be really dark and it should really do that work. But too much of anything will choke you to death, you know. Yeah. I just, I need music to uh, exist much like a hometown buffet so that I can be like peanut butter, jelly, horseradish, tapioca, you know, I yeah. I need to have a weird concoction, you know, um, of music, and because I, we obviously play some dark shit, but I don't want the whole evening to be that way. It's or like certainly, Patton Oswalt. Certainly said. not anymore. Oh, his shit is way dark. Well, what he says there is like, don't have every every joke edgy. Yeah. Or yeah. there's no edge. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A guy try, tries to get up there and be like, I'm edgy every bit. Yeah. There's no counterpoint. I there's have no- one school shooting yeah. joke, not nine. <laughs> <laughs> How about just one school shooting and not nine? Oh yeah! Okay. Uh, oh fuck! <laughs> that would be. <laughs> if we're gonna do that, let's wow, do. Wow! <laughs> wow! That would be a different America. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. It was great to see you at the uh, forum. So loose and uh, and so happy and just the. Uh, I got to tell you, the crowd had to be one of the best LA crowds I'd ever seen in years. They were fucking rocking. Man. I've, no- I've noticed that. I- I've noticed that. Uh, well, I've always noticed that for us, the the tough ones like LA, London, Berlin, New York, Amsterdam. These are tough crowds. They get to see everything. But for some reason, we've always had it quite easy there. Oh, where I- and I, I and I I uh, I really. Uh, like I said, I feel differently now. I know I, I appreciated it before and all this, but I just, you know, at this point now, I just, I just want to enjoy what's there. I, I, I think I spent so many years. You, when you're coming up, you know this. You, you, 
you're fighting a monster of the record company or these people or yeah. and you say things like they don't understand they just don't get us and at some point you can't say that anymore and that doesn't matter and it should be quickly <laughs> and at this point i feel like there's no, there's no, there's no reason for me to paddle upstream. This is my river. I'm, I'm. What am I fight against myself? I don't want to revolt. I want to create. I want it to make you think, but I don't need, I don't need a fucking revolution, man. Yeah. You know, I yeah. don't, I don't I, like. Uh, um, no, I want, I, I want to turn to someone and go. That's so fucking sick, man. Wow. <laughs> and and just, I want to love on things, even if they're dark, because sometimes it's brutal. But I want to be able to sort of dig those moments too and, and mean it, you know. Yeah. Let me ask you how you, uh, I, I checked the set list quite a bit from the last run just to see how it changed and stuff. But I wrote down the set list just because I thought it was just such an art, the journey that I was going through. The set list is a lot like comedy where it's just so hard to get a good set list. Yeah. Because you got, okay, we got to cover the records. We didn't play nothing on this one. Oh, shit, we have to do this, and we have to do this one. But you put together uh, one of the best set lists I've ever seen you do. And by the time you got to Better Living Through Chemistry, it was like, it, the show could have ended there. But then it went to another fucking level. How do you, do you write the set list? How does that come together? Yeah, I think the, for one, there's a philosophy that's so. I've looked at our, some of our old set lists, and we have our tour manager has them, and they're fucking insane because we have so many people that go to the to multiple shows, yeah. and I just can't, it can't be the same, or I'm going to go home. You know? Yeah, and I uh, and they're so wild, and I can see when they're deliberately just trying to be contrary and wild, and and as I said, I just, I have a, um, this is the first time I've ever stopped, looked back at what we've done, taken it in, and then thought, okay, I'm going to actually try to use what I understand. I've been so obsessed with racing forward that turning around and taking stock of it, I've just never done it. I've never, it's never occurred to me, you know? Um, and so now it's Mikey and I that are writing most of the set lists, and we take, we take, what did we play last time we were here? Even if it's eight years ago, what did we play last time we were here? What did we play last night? What did we play two nights ago? And, um, and sort of craft it. And right now we have a philosophy. The philosophy has come out and give away some of the big numbers or something. Oh, you know? yeah. Just get it. Not, it's not even get it out of the way. It's just grab yeah. everyone and come say come here close yeah We're, you open with no one knows yeah fucking why get, let's then, just have it and then you hit them with lost art to keep it a secret like back to back and i was like oh my god yeah with no stopping and like just yeah. like seize the moment and announce yourself this is sort of the philosophy that philosophy and then you know um then let it get groovy and then say okay we did we came out and it's there's this explosion of it emotionally yeah but now everyone take your take some take one article of clothing off. Let's get loose. It, it by then you're sweaty, and then you want to sort of move that around. You know, you it's like Zeppelin opening with rock and roll. Yeah, but you, then like four songs in, they hit you with no quarter. Yeah, and they take you for this psychedelic fucking ride. Well, and then once you do, once there's something kind of psychedelic like that, because that's exactly the philosophy of yeah. what you're saying, is then you get wide and wild, and then after that, it should all fall to the ground. You know, we did villains, I think. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it should fall to the ground and get, you know, sometimes it's scary to, and I, I, it must be the same for comedy. It's Sometimes it's scary to go slow and be quiet. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, it's taken years to be okay with silence and, and comfortable and ha it's okay to have 30 seconds of discomfort and unsure, unsurety, whatever, is that, I think... I think this is a German word that means don't look at me, uh, but un, un, to have moments of unsure. Well, that, that weird tension, yeah. like, especially with comedy. Like, two years ago, I purposely went real slow yeah. all year. Yeah. I've never tried comedy real slow. Yeah. 
and, and and you've been doing it so long it's worth a shot to see what that means 100 percent. because who says this is my style the yeah. first 10 fucking 11 years yeah i don't know i just started doing it and this yeah. is how it, it happens right it's a development more than anything else exactly. it's still being developed yeah and it's off the back of all this and, and I, I think being quiet silent or slow um it's a bit like carrying a piece of glass that's too big <laughs> You're sort of like, oh my God. Oh. <laughs> but um, it's critical that you do it right or the whole thing breaks apart, right? Oh my God. And, and I, so I, th- I, I do think that, uh, I also think you get a lot more when it's quiet and you speak slow and deliberate and clear. And it's so much louder than yelling some, somehow. Oh it's my so, God. It's so much louder than screaming somehow. Well, you know? tension is what it builds sure especially uh a slow song or uh slow in in comedy where the people are like oh this is fucking weird yeah it's weirder and weirder and then it just boom it's a chance to reset it's a chance to reset the the, totally the emotion of what's going on yeah i mean I, i now i crave those moments to take it down and and uh Especially because uh, I want to be able to have a good time, but that, you know, it should be well balanced where there's moments of just like, uh, you know, it's okay to turn, you know, you don't have to turn on the fucking charm 24 hours a day. It's like that these fragile moments aren't like, hey, is that how's everyone doing tonight? Yeah. Now we're going to do a quiet number. It's like, don't tell me anything. Show me everything. <laughs> yeah. You know? We're going to bring it down. Yeah. I mean, all that shit that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's a little too MC. That's obviously not my, that's not my way. But, you know, and I also, th- I think for Queens, I mean, John Theodore and I mean, Mikey Shoes is one of the most incredible bass players I've ever seen in my life. He's, oh my God. He's kills. so good. He kills. Like my guys, Dean and Troy, honestly, they're so they're so good at playing music <laughs> that I, I, a lot of times I'm like, we really don't need to do anything except focus over here for a while, focus over here for a while, you know. When Theodore starts playing those, like, that kind of a, you know, a chemistry, that little conga sound, yeah. that, as soon as he started playing that, I just look at Burr and I go, oh, fucking my favorite song ever right now. Yeah, set- I, I knew what was coming. Yeah, setups are so fun. Oh. But see, that's the thing. Like, I, uh, before I was so focused on, you know, I think I was like, you're trying to like rip things out of the ether and bring them into being. And it's, it's all so fucking rugged. And this, and I just don't have that same feeling in this moment. Yeah. Like, I just want to enjoy, like, you hear the congas of that. And if you know us at all, you go, oh. <gasps> Here we go. Yeah. And I, I, I almost want to, I want to suck on those moments a little longer. <laughs> Dangle it longer. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. just like, just Jolly Rancher. I used to bite, I oh, bite yeah. a Jolly Rancher and just destroy it. And now I, I tell you what, I suck that thing till it ain't, that don't exist <laughs> no more. <laughs> Jolly Ranchers is straight Little League for me. Yeah. Did you play Little League? <laughs> no, no. God damn, you played football, I remember. But Little League, to me, it was just so much about showing up at the park it, I tell people it was my first real introduction into performing because you got the oh uh, how so oh well, because you, the crowd the is there the bleachers are there the parents and you mean the situation of performing yeah yeah because you're there and you're like I, I wanted to look good so I always had the best like cleats i could get and i had the fucking outfit and, you know and you but is it but isn't it but isn't that uh, did, did that desire to want to look a certain way did it distract from being able to do the thing to to play little league i think or is that too deep for little league no i think you're almost right though because you're so worried about what you're gonna look like like the big leaguers you're looking at it's like yeah when you're a kid you know when people are watching you're like oh my god what the fucking people yeah, are watching i want to look like a baseball player is this right <laughs> yeah you know, instead of just showing up in some fucking sweatpants and swinging the bat yeah you know? the, your dream of what a baseball player should look like yeah. and i got the stuff yeah outfits are funny like that they like are sports outfits or just outfits for anything as you know, you dress up like a cop and you're like, man, fuck, this is what it's like. I've dressed up like a cop so many times because it feels so good for once <laughs> to just be on that side of the law. Halloween? So like, Halloween is just like, you know, I've been a priest or a police officer so many times because I just like, I mean, more more the cop because you're like, ah, oh, so this is what it's like. <laughs> I'd love to just pull myself over. Pull myself oh, over. Yeah. <laughs> Let me ask you something. Um, 
You guys closed the set with a song for the dead. Of course, it's the land again. You and Lan again. That's like a classic. And you gave yeah. a shout out to Lan again and uh, Taylor. And Rio, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and Rio. It's, it's a fucking, it's a heavy thing, man, when uh, like people are gone way too soon, you know? Especially, I think, I mean, that's so close. Uh, those are all people that are, were, I've, it's so close, and they they pass so close together. Yeah, and uh, you know, I still text Rio all the time. I text his phone. <laughs> I text yeah. his phone all the time. Yeah, and I, I, fuck, I do that with Tony to Bourdain too. I, I texted him for years. I, 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 uh, I, uh, yeah, I just don't like that that much. I, you know, I'm surprised <laughs> it ha- doesn't happen more in the business that we're in. Yeah. When I, I thought about it last night, because I was going to ask you about this, and I was like, you know, it's really a handful of people in like the last 30, 40 years that are gone compared to the Well, there's sort of, of a the- grip of like Prince and David Bowie right. and Lemmy. Right. And, and those are all in a close, really, within, I think within a year of each other. Right. And, uh, and like it, it's, when it happens in a, in a sort of grouping, you, you sort of, it takes you aback. I mean, one is already a lot, and right. in the case of someone like Lanigan, who had like a you know uh, uh, times of heavy duty drug use and then times of sobriety and all, you know, it's weird because I would say to myself, I I can't believe he's dead, you know, he's too young. But then I would say, I can't believe he lived that long. Right, right. <laughs> and so I I was and you know I also and then I think, oh my, I'm so stoked that I had that many years with someone who's so much, and in my opinion, is just so much better than, <laughs> at, at, at being a singer. Yeah, oh my God. Like he's just, like other people sing too, and I like I like tons of people, but this guy's probably better than you are. Like he's better than I am. It's, it, it's just, he's just better than most. <laughs> Someone's gotta be better than most people. He's incredible. Yeah, and Lanigan, it's just, you. I always say, you know, he sings about toothpaste and I want a brush, you know? <laughs> it doesn't matter what he's singing, he could be, you know, Pert Plus, reading the direct, singing the directions. Yeah. And I'd be like, wow, is it Xanthium gum? It's, wow. It's so crazy how powerful and real it was, you know? Yeah. I guess, you know, when it comes to singers, you really want to believe and that it's real, or I do. Yeah. And, and I, but I don't think I'm alone there, obviously. You know, it's, actors, they act, they act and someone else wrote this script and they're doing this thing and and it's okay that you don't you know you want to see them do a good job but you don't believe that someone is caesar you know? yeah 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 <laughs> right you know, that you don't believe that this woman is cleopatra yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, but when it comes to singing you need to know that it's real and that's some strange intangible thing but with lanigan I mean, you knew Lanigan well. You know, you never doubted what he was saying. You never like, I, I love this song, but obviously you're full of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even uh, once I started to really get to know him, I was oh, like, yeah. oh, oh, this shit is for real. <laughs> <laughs> when you've experienced the ups and downs of Ooh, hanging out with Lanigan. The late night text, <laughs> oh you're God. like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> I, I think him. the gas company's trying to kill me. And I was like, I believe that that is totally not happening at all. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but thanks for texting me at 2.30 in the morning, yeah. It's funny to talk about Tony because I was in Palm Springs recently, which, uh, like you, I absolutely love the desert. I, I think it's the most magic place on earth, but that prime rib place is gone. Oh, I know. Fuck. Lord Fletcher's. Everything yeah. goes away. Well, so I took, to, so uh, like a, uh, a little known fact about that, you know, Tony had done a show about the des and uh, yeah. about the desert. And, and, and it's my favorite of all time. Yeah. One of the best TV I've ever seen with you and him together. Oh, well, we, we'd been friends for a decade by then. It's so good, though. And, and so it was like, uh, I just said, you should let me take you to these places, not having to do with the show. And he's like, well, why don't we film it? I said, you already did, you already did one, a desert show. And he's like, so what? I'm just, I'm circling the world over and over and over. I'm going to keep doing it. And so I, I learned from his producer that whenever he would go somewhere, that the sort of metadata was that uh, that place experienced like 300% uptick in business right. for nine months and then sustained for, you know, sort of dissipating, but 
for the next three years. That was the kind of numbers that how it worked. Powerful. So I just took them to everywhere that was about to close. <laughs> really? Yeah, everywhere, everywhere <laughs> that we went. Jack Every, them up. Well, because there were places I really because you know you. As is the case with the internet and the way things are today, like it's like t- the 10 best secret beaches where yeah. you're like, you fucking asshole. You just told everyone what the goddamn best secret was. Yeah. It's not a secret anymore, you son of a bitch. <laughs> you know, it's, it's lame to blow up everything. Yeah. But in the case of this, it was like these places will be gone or some are very close to that. You know, the Integratron was, was fine, was doing fine. But I just knew he would like that place, you know. But the other place, Lord Fletcher's and the Swap Meet. The Swap Meet's now gone. Swap it's kind of, I mean, it's there, but it's kind yeah, of like... The drive-in like, theater one. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, it's not what it once was, right. you know. Um, so I just took him to as many places as I could, that, knowing that it would work. It was so good. Yeah, in fact, the Country Kitchen was one of the places I took. And the, the woman who worked there, Ryan. She always used to like call me water, water boy, drink water. Because she's like, yeah, tall drink of water. She never knew my name for like, 15 <laughs> years, 20 years. It was actually 20 years, 25 years. Never knew my name. And then when Tony was there and I walked in, I said, hey, Marine. She's like, who are you? <laughs> it, was the, it was the first time she ever asked me who, what my name was or who I was after 20 years. And it sort of ruined a little for me because then she made a shrine to Tony. She, I didn't, unbeknownst to me, she was massive Tony fan, right? Yeah. So after that, there's like a shrine to me and Tony. I'd walk in, she'd go, that's Josh. He was the guy that, and so she, it sort of like killed that spot for me. Yeah. She, she ended up selling it, and which was great and being able to get out and, and retire, you know? And the place is still open and it's great. It's run by people, people there now. But it's funny how sometimes... Uh, Sometimes you can destroy your favorite thing. You could destroy something by absolutely, you know, absolutely. revealing it. I th- that's why I've always loved secrets so much. I yeah. love holding secrets and having them, and you know, it's like my buddy makes boots, Brian the boot maker. Sure, all the from downtown. That yeah, fella, yeah, yeah, the best. He's amazing. Yeah. So for years, I didn't really want to tell anybody because I wanted to be able to get boots. So I brought Lanigan down there, and he's like, "Oh, yeah, man, I remember. Yeah, fucking amazing. I'll fucking take amazing six boots, pairs. man. Yeah, yeah, take six pairs." <laughs> Oh, that was his that was his habit of like totally totally <laughs> when he'd be really just to interject yeah. when he'd be really sort of on a tear let's say for for the sake out of respect to Lanigan yeah when he'd be on a tear we'd be in Europe and he would just buy jeans yeah and he'd be like I need a new piece of luggage I was like why are you telling me dude I don't I'm not your luggage guy and he'd be like oh I need a bag for jeans I was like are you sharing with me or you're not asking me to do anything about this and <laughs> he'd have his luggage and then three bags all filled with jeans and then he was like i'm tired of taking them around and he just left them all in a hotel room <laughs> <laughs> so when you're like he bought six pairs of boots i'm like you're goddamn right he did yeah yeah matter of fact the first tired time, of carrying these around i'm not gonna carry them i was interviewing him goddamn jeans we're getting into something heavy we're about 30 minutes in and he goes yeah fuck all that Where'd you get those glasses? I never <laughs> forgot it. I never forgot it. Uh, that's what, you know, people don't understand. I, you know, he was, he, he died a, still a relatively unknown figure. Yeah, totally. He's going to be, someone's, you know, I think of him like stumbling on something beautiful in the desert. Someone's going to be walking and trip on Lanigan and they're going to get up and listen to Lanigan and that's going to change their lives. Yeah. And that's going to happen over and over and over. And it's so beautiful that that, I mean that's why it's so cool to do this stuff we do. It's I like, fucking love I love it. I, it's 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 and you know, Lanigan, people they don't understand how rough and gruff and kind of mean he could be and then how sweet and funny, you know, you're dealing with someone that's an eccentric person. They're they're only extremes. Yeah. There was a narrow moment where he was a sort of moderate <laughs> yeah. person, you know. Because for him to say, fuck all, like he could intimidate someone so quickly, fuck all that. Where'd you get those glasses? <laughs> it was great. That, like, if someone else said that, you'd be like, whatever, I'm not, that's not something you would remember. Yeah. yeah. But it was just great because then I was like, well, here's this guy who I hold on to this kind of Morrison pedestal of like, whoa, super art. But at the same time, we're about to bond over Japanese acetate and, <laughs> and, 
eight barrel hinges and handmade frames. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I really like, uh, you know, I'm into the JMMs. Yeah. And he I, was so well read and so well listened to. And he was, man. that's all he was doing is like, what is, where'd you get them glasses? Yeah. 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 So late night, he would hit me up like, scored a new pair of denim. You heard of these guys? Twelve ounce, twelve ounce. Right? Yeah, he's a denim. He was a denim yeah. freak. Iron Heart. He loved it. Yeah, but then that's why I say it was so funny because he was he had been up for enough days that he was like, "Fuck it, I'm not carrying them anymore." Yeah, he yeah. just accumulated them. He's not going to send them anywhere. No. no, don't put them in a box and send them home. Oh. He's just like, that's enough. <laughs> It's enough. And you know when he gets I've gotten home. all the joy out of these I'm going to get. That's enough. <laughs> yeah, when he got home, he was probably like, fuck, I left God those. Damn. He probably uh, called. You got any money? I don't have any PDs. <laughs> I got no He'd be PDs. like, dude, what do I look like? You fucking ATM? You know, I have this relationship with a lot of people where <laughs> nobody says just joking, but it's a bit like the odd couple, like a cram or a crammed it in Norton sort of yeah. relationship. And I, 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 those are the things I miss. I miss Lanigan being like, all my PDs are gone. You got it. And I'd be like, well, what am I supposed to do? You know, yeah. acting as if we're an old married couple. You know? yeah, give me some more. Yeah. You're the boss. <laughs> it's like, well, I look like a goddamn ATM. Just the banter back and forth of uh, those relationships. When you go on tour, you see each other every day, this core group of people every day, yeah. all the time. And then you, there's thousands of new people, but there are always some kind of distance. You'll never know them, you know. But you know the people you're with so much that talking about we've talked about everything already yeah you know by three weeks in you've talked about everything everything so all that's left to do is hone these you know these like a weird marriage this crammed in a norton relationship with lanigan or you know or you make fun of stuff because you're making fun where there was none it's not like i don't it's not like i hate stuff it's just i'm making fun of stuff because i have nothing else to do yeah there's we're nothing else to bus. say yeah, yeah. I'm going to go to my bunk or I'm going to come out here and say some fucking crazy shit. Yeah, giggling on the rowboat to hell. Yeah. Right, you know? <laughs> Dude, I just broke my oar. You know, just that. Almost like the far side, like Gary Larson. Yeah. You know, it's a bit like that. You know? When you did the Taylor Hawkins tribute, first of all, you did one of my favorite songs of all time, uh, Bowie, Let's Dance. I saw that tour twice and I never, ever forgot it. How did that come about? Did you pick the song or, or uh, because you fucking kill it? Well, Dave picked it actually. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, Dave picked it and he, he basically was like, I think you would sing the hell out of this. And, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, sometimes things are so, in terms of cover songs, sometimes a song is such a, uh, an amazing hit song that you're like, I would, well, I wouldn't do that. It's so obvious. Yeah. Right. It's so, uh, or, or also it's done so well. I've always had this relationship with cover songs where I think, what are you supposed to be doing? Like, dude, you want to hear the 15th best version of this song? <laughs> right. <laughs> like, you know, there's some people you don't cover. You don't. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You right. kind of don't cover Zeppelin or Bob Marley or, yeah, you know, or, or, uh, Jimi Hendrix. What are you going to do? The ninth, yeah, the 90th. Yeah. yeah. Here, here it is certainly never even close to as good as it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, know, you don't want to be the B in an A-B comparison, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. So when he said that, I was like, okay, yeah, yes, is it a great song? Of course, it's so good. Should we even be doing something like this? But I must say, I enjoyed myself so much. There's some things, you know, you, you're singing Bon Scott, ACDC yeah, stuff. Right. And you've got the pipes to do that. It's really difficult to do. Super hard. But when something feels, but it must feel pleasurable and easy in its own way for you. Oh, man. Because you're not supposed to be covering Bon Scott because you can't. No, right. people can't do that. Yeah, most like, people do it wrong, you know. Yeah, or like because just, and, and some things it's like you, I, I always wonder, should you dare to put your own spin on it? I suppose you, you, you could. Right. But also just celebrating what a good song this is too without doing some really hackneyed version of it. You yeah. Know? Had you ever sang Let's Dance, Bowie? Because Why would he think... In the car. Yeah, but why would I he mean, think that you could do that? Because, man, did you... Ki I mean, you fucking kill it 
And I thought, well, he must have done that at like, uh, you no, know, sound never, check or something. Well, I mean, yeah, I was, I, I sound checked it in, in London once. No, but I'm saying like for <laughs> Dave to hear you go like, yeah, no, 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 man. no, and no, he just, he, he was the, in the, in the, the Taylor concert in London, now Rogers was playing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and they were doing modern love and, and, so he just called me saying, we're doing these songs and this is, this one would be great. You'd sound great, which was really lovely because it's, it's somehow easy to do and it's so much fun. Uh, like it's weird. It's like getting in someone else's car, some kind of beautiful car and driving around and going, whoa, wow, this thing is so cool. Yeah. You know? And then you're like, here, okay, here it is back. You have it back. But it was so fun to drive around in that song for a second. Yeah, I, mean, I loved it. It's, it's, it's such an easy, or it's such an, it's so easy to say this is a fucking great song. But I, I guess you don't hear covers of it really. Never, ever. Because it's so, you have no chance of, <laughs> of doing it. Yeah. Like a, unless you're playing with Nile Rodgers. Well, you were nailing yeah. the soul of it too, which I love. It's just like that, you know, put on your red shoes and da- the slipperiness well, of that. Well, but the, 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 yeah, I was listening to it because I thought, oh God. You know, as I've already said about 300 times in the last two seconds, it's 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 hard to when you realize like I'm gonna do the 200th best version of this right now, but but I guess also it was like you listen to him sing that song and he's really not trying very hard. Nope. So I thought, well, I just I'll know it, but I just won't I won't try. I'll just enjoy it. I mean, that honestly, that feels like something I've learned in the last few years. Like I'm not gonna just I'm not gonna try to do it i'll just enjoy myself you know because there's something about like i'm gonna try yeah oh god am i gonna try well there is some bowie uh flavor like straight jacket fitting which is fucking that one and sicily man yeah. those tunes just yeah. they just crush me but there is some bowie vibe on that which is cool yeah you know? well i think uh bowie's just does such an elegant job of of having a beautiful drama to his voice you know it's like uh i was playing uh the song black star for my kids uh, great three days ago because we were just talking about how music uh it can start and just morph into something and hold on to a theme and go from light to dark and and sort of almost like pulling it through the eye of a needle like kind of you know a thread through this a common thread through this long piece of music and they were they were just saying, how do you even do, how do you mix this? How do you even know where to go? Well, how's it? And, but the one thing to that song, his voice, and it's him at the end of his life, right? Yeah. But that, you know, at the center of it all. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, my. That, it's, it's terrifyingly dramatic and beautiful, but it doesn't seem like he's trying very hard. I, I, I think I, that was his real voice. You know? Well, but I just wonder if it's like the more you hear someone just be themselves. So not everyone sounds like Bowie, but if you're listening to somebody else, just be themselves and, and sort of doing it effortlessly. You know, it feels so good to yeah. hear that. I mean, I listened to that song, Black Star, and I'm like, I can't. It feels so good to hear it. <laughs> oh, my God. You know? Yeah, and especially knowing where he was in his life, you know. I mean, that just simply adds to it. But it certainly comes through someone just being themselves like that. Yeah. Let me ask you, looking back now on Villains, what are your thoughts on looking back on that record compared to where you're at on this record? Because Villains was so, of course, different than all of them. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I really love Villains. I I think this. I I think that... I had been working with Ronson on on Lady some Lady Gaga stuff, and I just loved him as a communicator. Yeah, he's like uh, he's got like eight brothers and sisters. Oh man! And so I thought, oh man, this guy, he's so motivated to. We can work it out. Let's work it out. You know, it's something he must have been dealing with since he was a kid. You know, and he's and he's funny, and also, I knew that he would want to. If he's wanting to scratch a niche he feels like he can't get to. Like when we work together, it's like, oh, he's doing Lady Gaga and all this other stuff and Bruno Mars. And so he doesn't belong with us. You know, that's, that would be the perception. You don't belong doing this or we don't belong doing something with him. That's the perception in reverse, right? But that's such a good opening gambit to, 
I knew that we were going to play some groovy tunes, but that's not unlike any record we've ever put out. Right. This one has some groovy. You yeah, know. of course. They, yeah. they, they all do. And it's, I knew, it's such a big part I, of you, I think. I knew if Ronson was there and I kept saying the word dance, we're going to dance. We're, this is a dance record. It's dance. Then everyone was going to write that, and people were going to go, "You know, this is much. This is a much dancier record, but it really isn't." <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like emotional rescue, the Stones. It's, it's not, but it's not any more or no, less. It's totally the Stones. It's you know, it's just so. I mean, and there's songs on there. There's a song called "The Evil Has Landed" that's seven and a half minutes long. That's fucking bananas, and it's the most almost avant-garde. It's the only. It's a song that is is as audacious as like songs for the deaf is, oh. and how. But and it's it's more than that song is in terms of its crazy musical shit, and that's on that record. That's like the artiest song we probably have, you know, and it's on this quote unquote dance record, and it's uh, so I love that record, and it's more about family, and as you know, we're talking about Bowie with who had a, the record Heroes, which is in a lot of ways why it's called Villains in a way, because it was like, yeah, heroes, we could be heroes. Does that mean we could be villains too for a while, just for one day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I, and so I, I think, uh, I really, I love that record. I think that if you, if you like that record, um, you think Ronson didn't have anything to do with it. And if you don't like that record, you think he had everything to do with it. And I think it's a little, un I've been in that position with the Arctic Monkeys. Yeah for when I produced Humbug, they wanted to slow down and get weird, but that had nothing to do with me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It had nothing to do with me. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to take the, I said to Alex, oh, I'll take the bullet here though. And he's yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll get to experiment. It's like when The Cure used Ross Robinson. I'll get to experiment. And if it doesn't work, I'll just shoot him. Here, hold this for a minute, would yeah, you? And then yeah. you just drive off holding the back. <laughs> And and what I love about Ronson is Ronson's no dummy. He understood this, you know. I mean, I I don't think anyone could come in and change the, what Queens does. Yeah, there's no. It just wouldn't. It's more like saying, "Hey, do you want to?" You know, in the case of Ronson, it's like Ronson's going to have some great ideas, and he's going to have some ideas we don't like, and then we we won't do those, and we'll do the ones that we like. And um, you're almost asking someone to just take a walk with you and go on this experience. But they can't really change who you are. I mean, no. Like, there's no real like chance of that occurring. Yeah. And uh, you know, in all honesty, some of the things that if someone's a naysayer, if they're and they're naysaying that record, I probably did that, not Ron. <laughs> Whatever you don't like, and you know what I mean. It's, yeah, the yeah. truth is, is is it's very blurry. It's all very blurry. And if you really love that record, it was you probably love something that that Bronson came up with. You know, I think uh, after Clockwork. Clockwork was so dark, and we which needed, is my favorite, by the way. It's kind of my favorite too. Yeah, you know? I mean, Songs from the Death is the obvious. It's like Power Age with ACDC. But I, I somehow think Clockwork, I, I like better. It's, I, I, it's it. There's something to that record when you first came over to the house, and you were talking about how you almost died and everything, and and you recorded a record, and then you fucking shelve it or whatever. Then you do this record. It is. It is a goddamn masterpiece. Well, thanks, man. I mean, I don't, I don't know about that, but I, I do know that uh, um, it's the, it's the one that I feel most accurate, accurately represents um, us and and myself, and um, I'm like that. That's what I'm like. Yeah. You know, is that record? And and uh, and um, you know, so and I remember saying to the guys that. Um, I was so convinced that this was that it was a mistake. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't going to change anything. Yeah, yeah. That I was like, I'm. I just want to say before it comes out, I, I'm really sorry. And uh, if we end up having to just headline the Troubadour again, uh, you won't see me anymore. And and I, so I kind of I apologize in advance. <laughs> <laughs> We're going back to the small rooms because like, of this record. Th this is not going to go well. Hi, my name is Josh. This is not going to go well. You know, it's just I felt I was adamant that it was uh, it would be the end. You know, and in fact, it was the exact opposite of that. Yeah, you know? yeah. But so I felt like villains was sort of like, all right, hold on a moment, hold on, just one minute. Okay. Let's just everyone like open up some beers. <laughs> it felt like villains was like, yeah, it's dark, but let's shoot some pool and get fucked up for a second. You know? Yeah, yeah. It, it, that's emotionally, that's what it felt like. You know, and uh, and then I, you know, I like to work in three record cycles. You know, and I think I think. 
lullabies and era were trying to find the next cycle to start, you know, sort of like kicking the can around and seeing what's what comes out of it, you know. But it felt like it felt like a, it felt like in times New Roman the villains come like clockwork. That's yeah, it, it felt like a whole. There thing. it is. Yeah. Well, uh, oh, I will tell you this. I it, it was great when you uh, go to the forum and you end up sitting around all the people that you know and Jeselnik sat next to me. And uh, we're you, you must you must know those guys, all those. Of course. Yeah, yeah I mean, I was, I I was thinking, oh, I bet you guys are going to be like, great. hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Now, you know, I always like to. Because I love him. He's, Jeselnik is fucking hilarious. I always like to have a, a one up him on the jackets, you know? <laughs> I know he's going to be there, so I'm like, let's <laughs> let's put this fucking jacket on, you know? And, I, and I'll see him, he'll be like, oh, fucking guy. You know, when, when we played San Quentin. Well, that's what I was going to talk about. Yeah. When yeah. he. And I told him as he sat down next to me, I go, man, seeing you here still reminds me of your, one of your greatest bits ever of just talking the warden, that whole oh, thing. Dude. It's fucking on unreal. Kimmel, right? uh, yeah, on Kimmel, right? Yeah, on Kimmel. Yeah. And I, could, I, I said, if you're going to do this, you need to not get arrested in San Francisco really bad. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm to, you know, we went after we played San Quentin and got San Qu- tattooed together at my friend's place and had Temple tattooed. Yeah. And, uh, in Oakland, and, and he's like, "Man, God damn it, I'm going to do a bit," because the, for those of you who don't know that, you know, Anthony Jeselnik came with Queens to play San Quentin. Right. They have an arts program, and and that prison has really turned into sort of a reform. There's too many people in jail, basically. Yeah. <laughs> and and this, they're they've gotten very reformist about trying to deal with prisoners. That, um, anyways, uh, and the warden was a his daughter was a fan of ours and he was a fan of ours, but he was not a fan of Anthony Jeselnik. <laughs> yeah. But he didn't really share that with him yeah. until we got to the prison. And then he shared it. The warden shared it with Anthony, like a little too hard and a little too much. And, you know, if you know anything about Jeselnik, that's all he needed. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, he looked at me. He was like, so I don't know. He's like, if you do jokes and insult these people, you know, you're like an insult comic, and you know I like comedy too. This guy was saying, "Oh yeah, one of those guys." I'm, was, I'm, I'm kind of a connoisseur. Oh, he was, I've got Netflix. He was a bit cunty. Let's yeah, put yeah, it that right, way. The guy right. was cunty, and uh, and he said, he said, "Well, you could have told me this." He goes, "Warden," because <laughs> he was like slipped into his onstage persona, oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. so quickly. Yeah, and you know, you realize what a sizable portion of his real person that it is. Yeah, and he was like. Well, you know, Warden, you could have told me this two fucking weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the way he talks. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. he, but the way his timing, his cadence is so slow, you know, again, back to going slow and going quiet or whatever. His cadence was slow. So when the way he said fuck, he was like, you could have, you know, Warden, you could have told me this two fucking weeks ago. <laughs> And I was like, holy shit, oh, we're no. in the parking lot. And, oh, in the parking lot. But I was like, holy shit, get him. Go get Nathan Jr. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, get him because I don't, I don't work here. I don't work for the warden either. I don't fucking, I'm here yeah. to infiltrate and, yeah. you know, I'm here to spread art where it doesn't supposed to go or whatever yeah, the fuck. Right. So, and he said, well, how about I just bring the band? So the warden was like, you can't do your set. Yeah. And I felt terrible, of course. You know, I'd ask him to be here. Of course. You know, he was giving me shit because we flew up on Southwest Airlines, the whole thing. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, I love it. <laughs> anyway, so he <laughs> he was very he was very smart. Jeselnik was very smart because he goes, uh, uh, "How about I just bring the band on, and I'll just essentially like frisbee a few jokes at these people." Yeah, you know? yeah. And and he took the the warden was like, "Okay, fine, thirty seconds." Thirty seconds. <laughs> so a minute and a half later, <laughs> Jeselnik is still up there. Yeah. And he is dicing and slicing the warden. He's like, like to thank the warden. Yeah. And everyone's like, oh, boo. And he's yeah, like, yeah. For, he's the, everyone's, it's this completely segregated audience, by the way. Oh, really? Blacks are sitting with blacks, Mexicans, oh, yeah. Mexicans. And oh, because of whites. how they want it. Oh, dude. Yeah, yeah, I get oh, it. Oh, no. The, the prisoners have done this themselves. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah they, of course. So it's, to say it was tense oh. is not doing it a justice. <laughs> Oh and God. if you don't take charge of that audience, they will tear you apart. Of course. Right. And uh, anyhow, so Jeselnik is the, <laughs> it's like, like to thank the warden. And everyone's like, boo. He's like, for bringing his daughter. And the place, <laughs> ah, just, 
explodes. Yeah. You know, because the warden was telling Jeselnik, you know, you say the wrong thing, you get killed in here. But yeah. there he is, lo and behold, sitting in a goddamn front row with daughter next to him. Yeah. So I was like, well, how, how, you know, how dangerous is it? And if it is that dangerous, you're a bit of a fool right now. You know, the only lady in the place yeah. is your daughter. <laughs> like, oh, yeah. Who ordered the kidnapping? It was oh just like, my God. you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was fucking amazing because I have a lot of stories and you have a lot of stories and people that have traveled and been in the arts and stuff, they have stories. And there's a couple things that go wrong. After a while, the stories are bigger to the people than sure. to you. Mm. So you don't really know how to tell them anymore to, to amplify it to where people are like, isn't that a great story? And then the other person goes, no. Yeah. And so to tell a story... And, and he's not a storyteller type of comic. He's more one-liner, this kind of... Yeah, but he had something to prove. He was he was not... And, f- and f- fair enough to, to Jeselnik, he was like, this guy's kind of dissing me. You don't need to do it. He He's stopping something before it happens. I'm here. I'm willing to take the risk. What's yeah. your fucking problem? Right. I came right? up. And, and, and honestly, the warden was, was like... He didn't like Anthony from the outset. Yeah. It wasn't about nothing else but not liking him. Right. And it was like flexing on him like he was a prisoner already. Yeah. Right? And and he was essentially like, well, I'm just going to have to break out of this jail you're putting me in. <laughs> this kind of <laughs> yeah, emotional yeah. jail. Yeah. And yeah. so it was, very, it was very on the nose. And he was incredible. And he came out and bombed. Yeah. You know? He's like, for those, for those of you who know me, you know, you, you know me. Of course you know me. He's yeah, like, yeah. for those of you who don't, I'm the most famous comedian. I'm the something like a kid yeah. to like. I'm the I'm the most famous and best comedian on the planet, and I'm good looking. <laughs> yeah, He'll yeah. Like throw all that stuff. When it was like, yeah. when it, and, and he's it, bombing, huh? It, he bombed that that bombed. Right. But then he immediately pivoted to the warden. Yeah. Which was so, uh, so intelligent, you know. And I think it's fair play to be cocky with the prisoners because I had to take control of that audience you know i would realize right away it's like i gotta look everyone in the fucking eye here i cannot look away i gotta and you know they want to heckle and so i i had to do my crowd work immediately yeah you know i was like what'd you say and, oh. and then he started to talk and i was like I, I was like you know pulled an old johnny cash was just like sorry interrupt him and go sorry i can't hear you i was talking <laughs> you know you have to shut people down yeah you know you don't talk till i say so you know that sort of tonality yeah because they were they're talking to each other. Forget us. They were talking to each other. Like, you know, is that what you think, Joker? Oh, you know, yeah. Yelling yeah. across the fucking aisle. I was like, oh, shit. Yeah, oh, con- wow. That con- kind of stuff. The convicts were like, conflict. Yapping at over. each other. Yeah, oh, d- dude. The daily conflict I was in like, between. I, fucking- I, was like, I was like, hey, save it for the showers, boys. Oh. I'm, play- I'm playing here. Oh. You know, I was like, I've, yeah. I was thankful for my own, like, thinking on my feet in yeah. the moment. Yeah, because I'm like, wait a minute, it's, this is you, they're about to take this thing over. Wow, that that can't happen. You know, I mean that that really that can't, that can't happen. You know. Well, man, thanks for uh, coming and doing the show again, man. I, yeah, I, you know I love you. That's always a pleasure. We'll we'll we got to do the one where I'll yeah I'll follow your ass around. And I I just uh, I mean you're like one of my favorite humans. I can't thank you enough for being on the show and just being a friend man you're such a great friend oh i don't know about that and an amazing human and man that fucking show go see them what are you going to australia australia new zealand yeah and then what else back to the state come back doing bottle uh, rock i'm thinking of coming up yeah we're gonna do that it's uh are you gonna bus up there yeah i'm sure i'm sure we will i wanted to jump on the bus and go i'm sure yeah i think what we're talking about maybe even doing santa barbara bowl the friday before us oh because oh. that place is that place is nice to go see a show. That's my favorite. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I mean, that's what, that's what we're kind of talking about doing. Yeah. Oh my and, god. I gotta go with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Fuck. Let's go. I'm there. I'm sure we are taking a bus. We're not gonna walk there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just sleep yeah. on the fucking front lounge thing. No. No. You just crawl into my uh, yeah. bunk there. <laughs> How do you fit in those bunks? Find out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I love you, buddy. I love you, too. Good to see you. Yeah, Thank man. You. See you guys later. Don't forget, uh, catch them on tour. And thanks for tuning in. Leave a review and subscribe on iTunes and YouTube. Thank you. See you.